this is going to cost us $850 to replace. And the last one we replaced five weeks ago. <laughs> All right, it's the next day. So I ran two pallets overnight, very nerve wracking. I started it around 8 p.m. when I went home and uh, I'm sitting at home going, okay, it's gonna transition around 11 o'clock, 11.15. Do I wanna be there? Yeah, I wanna be there. So I came back to the shop at 11.15, just in time to watch the transition. There was one line of code that was wrong, so it actually skipped the second pallet and moved on. So I was able to fix that, which was good. And then I took my time and I got the second pallet running and it was working good, so I left. And it's like a three and a half hour run, so I'm not gonna stay here overnight to watch it. Um, come in in the morning and uh, Barry and Angelo found a broken piece sticking out of one of the blades. Um, let me show you here. So, I wanna explain this to you guys because this is a very cool tool that I've seen in Modern Machine Shop Magazine advertised for a couple years. And then eventually I called them up and I, I looked into it and uh, it's very expensive, but it's really awesome. It's called a Cogsdill burnishing tool. So it's super adjustable in one tenth increments as you put up the retainer and then rotate it. It's got a tapered mandrel here and three little ro tapered roller bear bearings that basically you spin this thing, I don't know, 200 RPM, something really slow into the blade and then it burnishes the hole. Those little rollers roll around the hole and they squish all the material out. So even as good of a finish as I can get with a drill bit or a reamer or an end mill interpolating the hole, which is what I'm doing now, it's still not a great, great finish. You put the burnisher in there and all those little microscopic peaks and valleys just get, you know, they get pushed aside and uh, the hole gets kind of flared out, burnished. Um, it leaves for a very accurate hole accurate to like within a tenth, super repeatable, and uh, leaves us a better finish for later on when we do the barrel lapping. So we've been using this tool for probably two or three years. I've broken two or three of them, um, two of them in the past two months. And yeah, $850 replacement. Um, not excited about that, but that's okay. It's the price of progress and I know why. So the blades go here, the cogs still, <clears throat> So we drill the hole, we interpolate the hole to like uh, a few tenths undersized, and then the cog still, while rotating, will go through the blade and pretty deep into the fixture and then come back out. Now, there was a set screw in there to because we don't need the hole, so we just put a set screw in there and then this guy crashed into the set screw. Such a silly, like easy mistake it's a bummer, nobody noticed it beforehand, whatever, water under the bridge, um, move on. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually gonna drill out those threaded holes because we don't need these two holes threaded and I don't ever want anybody putting out anything in there. So we're gonna drill them out and then uh, won't be a problem again. That aside, the dual pallet code works great. Like even with that, it finished the run anyway. It just had a piece of broken metal sticking out of the top and one blade that was bad. Um, but yeah, the dual code works amazing, which means the four code will work amazing and everything's really good. I'm excited. It worked awesome. Thankfully, last time we did have that problem a month ago for a different programming reason. Um, we ordered two replacements and we just used the second one this morning. So we're actually not down too much time, which is good. Now we're gonna go ahead and order two more because we can't be without this tool, we need it. So that's what we're gonna do. So one cool thing I started doing a long time ago that I wanted to share with you guys was this tool has 30 tools in the carousel and I'm always trying to maximize, you know, how much work we can get done with the same amount of tools without having to add new tools. So let me get a bigger example to show you guys. So this is a ball end mill. Normally with a ball end mill, you use it for contouring or little detail stuff. But then it feels dumb, but one day I realized, well, look at all this side flute that you're never ever using. Why don't I get to use that for something else? So I've started to maximize and use the side flutes of these balls as much as possible. And one thing that I do here is I drill out entry points and exit points, 
and I drop in a 1 8 inch ball mill and I slot that out with a 1 8 ball and then I go in with a 4 flute 1 8 square and I finish it. I do the same for the pivot hole. Um, if you look up at the tool here at the tool holder, this is my 1 8 ball that normally I use for contouring and the sides never get touched except for this one operation. So I thought it'd be a great idea to, you, you got to shove it obviously, shove it down below the radius and then use the flutes. But then you're closer to the shank, you're a stronger tool. It works really, really well. So in preparation for that Cogsdill tool, I'm dialing in the, the diameter of my pre-hole. So I've got these gauge pins here. So the pre-hole is too small, but the next tool is going to open it up. One moment, please. I've got optional stop click so that it only goes one tool at a time. Here's my four flute, one eighth inch ball, or uh, flat end mill. So it's finishing out that arc and then it's going to finish the pivot hole. Check to see if the tool is broken. Success. I'm going to use my pins and I'm going to see what size that hole is. Well, that one's an almost perfect fit. 6.5, it's too tight, man. All right, I want to make that hole size bigger because you don't want to force the uh, Cogsdale to do more work than it needs to. So we're going to play with that. One of the reasons back in the summer, I think, that I broke the Cogsdale tool was because as it enters a hole, it needs a really nice chamfer to be able to lead those um, roller bearings into the hole. And I think for whatever reason, one of my parts had a no chamfer. So those roller balls, the three of them, just kind of caught on the lip and exploded. Um, so that was reason number one. Reason number two why I broke one was because the way I formatted the code with the macros and the jump arounds, it, it jumped from one op to the next without calling the right tool offset. So it tried to profile around the outside of the handle using that Cogsdill tool. And it got in the way and it hit a clamp and it just broke. Dumb. Um, and then this third time was because there was a set screw underneath the hole. So is that $3,000 worth of mistakes? Anyway, let's try it again. So it's spinning, let's see, we're at 2,500 RPM. Um, I'll get us down close to the part. It's relatively unimpressive. And then I'm, I just added this tool breakage check. So I don't want to break the next two behind it. So that was that. It's kind of like rigid tapping. Like it's scary to watch, but it just works. So now I can measure the hole size and see how it worked, how I, I have to dial in the, um, the amount of preload on this tool so that I get the final size that I want based on the pre-size and then the final size and uh, a lot of you know tweaking around to get it working right. But boy, does it ever leave a very nice shiny hole. So I'm using my light, my Prometheus Alpha, to, um, to determine if that tool actually did anything. Because as I make it bigger, it actually starts to work. I think it's just too small right now, it's not doing anything. Yeah, so I gotta go bigger. I'm gonna go not much bigger. One, two, three, I'll try three tenths, so I'll run it again. All right, so once again, the way that the tool works is as you lift the collar and adjust the thingy, it kind of lifts up this mandrel on the inside that takes these three needle bearings and just makes them bigger or smaller in kind of a forceful way. So if, if I tighten it a bunch, then those three holes are going to want to make a bigger, or those three things are going to want to make a bigger hole. And then as you shove it into your workpiece, um, it flares away the material. And if you go smaller, then it just goes smaller. So now we've got the Cogsdill tool totally dialed in. I mean, we've had this tool now for two years and we used it for every single knife we've made. I love it. It really sucks when it crashes, but luckily we're able to fix it and move on. Ordered spares, they should be here soon actually. And uh, I've got it all dialed in. It's totally perfect. Um, I love it. So thanks for watching. See you guys next time. Bye.